Welcome to the post-screening Q&A of Judas and the Black Messiah, which releases in theaters where available and on HBO Max, February 12th. My name is Moira Griffin. I'm really excited to sit down today with director, co-writer, producer Shaka King, stars Algie Smith, Daryl Britt Gibson, Dominique Thorne, and of course, the incredible Akua Babu, who's the founder and executive director of the Pan-African Film Festival. So without further ado, let's get started. So hello, really hello. excited again to have you guys on board and really excited for Pan-African to be hosting this incredible screening. Um, and I know we have a short amount of time, so I'm gonna sort of rip through some questions. Um, and first of all, you know, Chaka, this film is obviously, you know, to me, uh, I don't consider it different you know, from the other work that you've done, I consider it a growth, right? Like you are just, everything that you're doing, you're sort of growing and growing and growing as a director and sort of using your tools. And I can feel, I can see it, right? All the tools that you sort of sort of built um, as a director, sort of just getting better. And so I wanted to sort of work back from the beginning and really like, what was the approach in terms of telling the story um, and telling it with a sort of you know, kind of like perspective and also the visual perspective that you have as a director, you know, not just your approach to the writing, but your approach to the directing. Hmm. Well, the way in was always kind of baked into the idea that was brought forth to me uh, by the Lucas brothers. They came to me and they said, we want to make a movie about Fred Hampton and William O'Neill. And we envision it as the departed set inside the world of Colin Telpro. And I instantly recognized that, you know, just understanding the industry, that that was the only way that a movie about Fred Hampton would be made. Um, you know, not only because of you know, his radical politics, but just, you know, as simple as the fact that, you know, Hollywood doesn't make, you know, big mid-budget features anymore, you know, um, and, they certainly don't do so for, I mean, look, like there isn't, you know, a Louis Armstrong biopic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he's far more well known, you know, across the world. And I mean, there isn't, uh, you know, even within the Black Panther Party, in terms of, you know, our own knowledge as Black folks, I think we know a lot more about Huey P. Newton and Eldridge Cleaver and Bobby Seale than Fred Hampton. You know, I'm sure that everyone can kind of, or like or a number of us in this panel, probably heard the name Fred Hampton growing up. Maybe even knew that he'd been assassinated and that he was a Black Panther. But I, I certainly didn't know much about the way he lived until I started researching personally for this movie. Um, and so, you know, coming from a from it, coming at it from that perspective, kind of couching it in genre, um, it it informed in a lot of ways everything. Because once you make that decision, then you have to sort of go, okay, well, then what are the how how is this beneficial to the messages that you're trying to put forth in the movie and the politic of the film? Because by nature, it's a political film if you do it correctly. So you know, you had to think about, okay, well, I mistakenly, when I was, it wasn't a mistake, it was actually the right way to say this at the time to get it made. I would say there's a Fred Hampton biopic, Trojan horse and an uh, undercover crime drama. That was like the elevator pitch. And I found myself saying that over and over and over again, but it actually isn't what the movie is at all. And never was the intention for that to be the case because for a number of reasons, I mean, look, Fred Hampton wouldn't, wouldn't want a biopic made about him, you know? Um, he wouldn't want to be elevated above his comrades, right? Uh, so it was like, okay, well, what this really is is an opportunity to put forth the ideas of Fred Hampton and the Illinois Black and the party at large. Um, putting, we can put forth those ideas in this kind of vessel you know, and slip the medicine, put the medicine in the applesauce, as Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. says. Um, and so then it was like, okay, well, 
let's actually, it's, it's kind of a good idea politically to in some ways centralize William O'Neill because in William O'Neill, by, by putting Fred Hampton right next to William O'Neill, you see even more so who Fred Hampton was by showing who Fred Hampton was not. You know, and it's this opportunity to explore, you know, these sort of two people who existed at the opposite end of the human spectrum. You know, uh, uh, one of the bravest people ever walked the face of this, this earth and a coward, mm -hmm. you know, an ultimate coward, a socialist and a capitalist, you know, um, an individualist and a person who was a master building coalition. Uh, and so that was kind of, that was the way in. And, and, and in terms of the visual style, you know, we pulled from, I pulled from everything because that's, as you mentioned, you know, this is a continuation of the work I've been doing. And I've always pulled ever since I saw Old Boy and discovered Korean cinema. Like, it was like, oh, I can, you can, so you can pull from everything and put it in one thing. Hmm. And so I, I've been doing that forever. And this was just an opportunity to do that. I mean, I think that's probably why that whole idea of like, even though it's not a biopic, but biopic has elements of biopic. So biopic, crime drama. Let's let's see what let's let's merge those. Let's see what that's like, you know. I love that. I love that. I, I mean, because you're also then working, you know, in this space, biopic, you know, crime drama, how then do you deal with, you know, and what was your relationship like with, you know, Fred Hampton's family, with you know, his son with Mother Akua, like what was that like in terms of you telling the story and just sort of trying to be as as honest, you know, about the portrayals of, of who they were, you know, of who, you know, and what that relationship was. I thought it was so beautiful. You're like your approach and the tenderness of that relationship. I thought that was a really, some really beautiful moments. One of my favorite moments, some of my favorite moments in the film. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, in terms of, you know, it, it, was, it was a tough proposition to bring forth to them like hey i want to make a movie about this person you loved and i also want to centralize this person you can't you, you detest you know but i just had to be very clear as to, like a saying that up front explaining our my rationale why hearing the concerns and and frustrations they had about that approach and then it took a year in some change of just conversation and building a relationship and building that trust. Um, and we didn't really, we didn't move forward, you know, officially until the second week of filming. Uh, and, you know, how we got there is really a combination of a lot of people's efforts, but certainly like Ryan, like people, like Ryan was not only the reason that, you know, Warner Brothers said yes, Ryan was also the reason that Fred Hampton Jr. said yes. Mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with the fact that, you know, Ryan made this incredibly successful movie. It had to do with the person that Ryan is and, and, and just like Fred Hampton Jr. had a very clear sense of who he was. The fact that they met in Oakland when Ryan was at the film school at, at like in, a, in this marketplace which him and Fred Hampton Jr. was handing out flyers and they remembered one another in a like from a from a like 30 second encounter a mm. decade ago over a decade ago probably it was meant to be you know and and they could recognize that it was meant to be they could recognize the timing they could recognize the rare opportunity that existed just now and in 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 just the culture the way the culture is moving where you can get a movie like this made without having to sacrifice any integrity you know, but it was a lot of a lot of factors involved that I think eventually brought them to the table. And I can't think of, I mean, look, like it was the dream, you know, it was the dream to have them. It was a dream to see their name in the credits. That was always, it was always like, yo, I want to, like, you know, I wanted to, get, <laughs> I was I, in my dream, like, cause I was like, it'll be amazing if like it was produced by Fred Hampton Jr. In my mind, like when I first, you know, told Ryan and like yo like we got to sit down with them um but that was impossible you know yeah. it was impossible and, and ultimately it would have been it would have made the, the, the process more difficult for everyone including them if they'd had to be that intimately involved but they were on set every he was on set every day 
once you know after that second week he was there every day wow that's good that's great mm-hmm. and and you know sort of what was it like also kind of you know you obviously have a long relationship with ryan right you also are then bringing in kind of going with the whole macro right, right with charles king how did that piece sort of come together obviously it's sort of a family but that doesn't always mean you're going to work together right how did why was this project the one that sort of made it all work well ryan and charles obviously they they had an agent client relationship and friendship for years but when ryan started his company he always planned on working with Charles and they were just finding they were I think waiting to find the right project and when this one came along it just made perfect sense and Charles came on board I mean like probably less than a week after Ryan did it was almost instantly and Charles was like I'm going to put up half the money so that we can have real control over this um and who else was going to do that (laughs) you know who else a has the ability and B has the politics, you know. That's fantastic. And, and Dominique, you know, Daryl, Algy, when you guys see this script, right? And you, you know, you come to it, what do you, know, what comes across your mind? Like, what was the, was it the story? Was it the characters? You know, did you have to do a lot of research? What was it about this piece of work that, made you say, I, I really want to be a part of this project. And we can, we can go to Daryl first. Um, I mean, first and foremost for me was um, knowing who the captain of the ship was going to be and knowing that that was Shaka um, and the opportunity to work with him. Again, I had done something with him before. Um, and I just remember like having this sense of, um, uh, he just has this energy um, and this love for not only the craft, um, but for the, for the actors and for, for an actor's opinion. Um, and, and he's such a collaborator um, and he's a, he's a true artist. Um, so if, if Shaka is directing anything, if, you know, I'm, I, I'd run toward that, um, uh, towards that opportunity. Um, and also knowing that Shaka was, was going to be telling this story that, that is so important um, and that has not been told um, um, because you look at it, the way that um, I wouldn't know anything about the Black Panthers if it was up to um, the education system because they're scrubbed from the books. You know, I thank God for my for my beautiful parents who um, educated me on them, um, or else I wouldn't know anything about the Panthers. Um, and so the, the combination of Shaka and the material was an absolute no brainer, um, and it's something that I feel so blessed to to be um, you know asked to be a part of because I understand the obligation of it um, and the history of it and the legacy um, and the importance of it. So, um, you know, it, it, for me, it was, it, it was, you know, tell me when, when do I show up on set? <laughs> Cause uh, there's no way I'm gonna miss this opportunity to tell this um, iconic story um, that has been brushed aside um, in, the, in the history books that we are, that they, you know, feed us growing up. I love it. And, and Dominique, you go from skeptic, you know, you know, you're like the tough, you know, the tough cookie, right? Throughout the whole, whole film, you know, um, how much fun was it to, to sort of play in that space? You know, what was that like for you? Um, I think the, the word that comes to mind is blessing, is honor. Um, I think that we're all kind of on the same page when we say that as much as you think, you know, there's always more uh more learning to be done and so Harmon to me represented a way of doing that in a in a in a real concrete authentic way in an authentic lens that uh before my introduction to her I, I didn't really have so I thank her and I thank uh Shaka and the, the writers for really just creating a script creating a character creating an environment um that could contribute to this story in a way that moved it forward um, and that was essential because I do think that um, learning of this project and learning that it was being done was one in the same with knowing that, you know, you had to at least make an attempt to contribute um, in a real way. So it's just an honor to know that um, I was able to attempt to highlight the voices of these women because that that is who she is. She's a, a composite of so many women that were there and that were active and involved um, in the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. 
um, with no limitation. That's great. And then Alja, your character, he's, you know, he just breaks my heart because, uh, uh, you know, you want him to, to win all the way through, you know, especially at the end. And, and I'd love to know sort of what you were thinking, you know, what you were thinking in terms of how your, your character really transforms and who he becomes. Yeah, I think from the very beginning, from the first day on set, um, just to p kind of piggyback off of what Daryl and Dominique were saying about Shaka, he came to me the first day on set and we had a brief conversation just about the character arc. And I feel like that to me was very important because we could have had that conversation any other time, but it was like, he just knows how to get to everyone and how to meet you where you are. And I feel like that conversation sent me on um, my study path for what I wanted to do. I didn't have a lot of um, study material for Jake Winters. I didn't have anything I can go back and look at. I didn't have anything I could read. I didn't have anybody I could talk to, which is kind of like the same for a lot of us that joined on. But I think for me, it was knowing the responsibility that I had with this role, because I'm not sure about you, but I haven't seen another role um, or another film where a young black man is has a, a machine gun to a police officer's face and he pulls the trigger. So the responsibility of stepping into that role and knowing what that comes with, um, it was real heavy for me. But I also know that that's how the world feels. We need Fred Hampton, but the world feels like Jake Winters. The world feels like that. It feels like that. It's just tired. You know, everyone is just tired. And it's like, okay, well, we have to stand up and we have to do something. Not saying you got to go to those extremities, but some of us may have to. You just never know. So that was the real weight for me to take it on. And then, Babu, when you when you saw the film and you experienced it, what was it like, you know, for you, especially sort of knowing that you were sort of a part of this history as well? What was that what was that experience like for you watching the movie? We we tend to forget over time the complexity and the confusion and the lostness of these kind of brothers and sisters who did those kind of dastardly deeds. Um, and he Shaka. He really did a good job of showing the complexity, the confusion, the lostness of one, of, the, of these these kind of characters. One of the scenes in, in my uh, as I watched the film was when uh, the F agent asked him about um, the three little girls. Was it three little girls? I think it was. I think it was three little girls uh, in the bombing. Oh no! Ask him about the. Uh, 64 civil rights, uh, the three people killed in, in Mississippi, and he had no clue. And uh, the actor really, really caught that he's so out of it. And here, this this story of the three civil rights workers being lynched and killed in Mississippi was all over the world, everywhere. And this brother was so isolated and so lost in his confusion that he had no idea about that. And the, and the FBI agent looked as though this is somebody we can use because he's not plugged into that at all. So that really, really uh, grabbed, they really, really grabbed me. Um, Cause that's the kind of people that were being used. And we have no idea about these people. You see them every day in the streets, but there are people who did not know, you know, everybody. That's like saying today, um, George Floyd, you'll be shocked to know that some people uh, right down on Crenshaw that know about the story of George, George Floyd, and that's the kind of person that they would use. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, and actually, like, something I just want to chime in on, you know, because I've actually, it's, you know, Algie and I haven't had a chance to, I mean, I haven't had a chance to talk with Algie or Dominique or Daryl on a panel like this. this. is the first time we're getting a chance to do this, but, like, I think a lot about Jake Winters um, mm -hmm. in, you know, the person, but even more so, I think the character in the film, uh, and you know, the uh, the just like he contextualizing it in, in his actions in a lot of ways. And you know, for me, when I think about that character and, and what he does, and why you know we chose to show it, you know, I mean, to, for starters, like if we hadn't, they would have said we were sanitizing the history, so it had to be in the movie, right, and had to be acknowledged. Um, but for me, it was also thinking about how, you know, as, as black people, we are hyper aware, hyper aware of the trauma that we ingest on a daily basis when we see ourselves, you know, murdered by the state, you know, and on cell phone videos, you know, and, and, and on in movies and on in television. 
and we take that in and we talk about the trauma that we experience and and you know even when we look at the trauma that we inflict a lot of times on one another you know it stems from the trauma that we it all stems from the trauma that we have experienced under american apartheid you know um and so i wanted to show that you know sometimes that trauma isn't weaponized against us it's weaponized against the state you know um and the same way that you know quite frankly our our violence against us has to some degree been normalized you know um i think that the way that you kind of create radical empathy in this world is normalizing you know just what that looks like when it's inflicted upon other people you know and so i know that that moment's going to be a moment that people talk about and and because like Jake, you know, like like Jake, like how she said, you know, you uh, you don't, you've never seen that really, um, you know, uh, you've never seen, and you've certainly never seen that from someone, you know, with the kind of tenderness that Algie brought to that role, you know, and all the scenes leading up to that, and you know, you hear how his mother, the character's mother, speaks about him afterwards and how polite he was, and you've gotten that without even knowing a lot about Jake, when it's just from the way that Algie expertly gave him that kind of heart you feel it throughout the movie so i just wanted to show that you know like there's a movie that's gonna we're gonna we as black people are gonna experience a lot of trauma watching it throughout the process but i think it's important for white viewers to experience the trauma of what it looks like when they you know feel that as well when they experience violence you know because like yo you know we're all blood and bone and skin you know what i mean just to piggyback just off of what Shaka just said, I think that's the importance that I I'm try, I make sure I mention in every interview as well. It's like, I'm, the fact that Jake was the vessel used to do that, the fact that Jake did that in real life, it, sh it shows so much towards what it's like to get beaten down to that point because he didn't start like that. He didn't start like that. He started out very excited, very happy, very joyful to serve. And then you just see everything going on around you and that beats you into a corner. It's like Tupac's thug life. It's just, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that you're saying. It's like, if you just constantly are getting beat down into a corner, when do you stand up? And I think that's why it's so, like, it was so perfect to be cinematically painted like that for Jake Winters to be that. Um, but it's but it also real life. So it's kind of weird to say just cinematically. I know it's crazy. It's crazy because of that. It's so crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. That's the best. I mean, I, I, I mean, honest, you know, all of it is crazy. So that's, you know, that's the, but that's the, uh, what makes history so interesting, right? And the, the, the hope that we don't repeat it, but we keep doing it anyway. Um, so, you know, one of the things in terms of, for Shaka is, you know, sort of talking a little bit more about your, you know, the way you, you approached um, camera is really like, can you, talk about the opening sequence in the bar and how you use camera to tell that part of the story and like what were your what were your intentions there yeah. You know? yeah, yeah yeah well we knew that after everybody saw the trailers and all that stuff that people would know um that bill o'neill's an fbi informant you're watching a movie about an fbi informant they'll go into the theater knowing that but you wouldn't necessarily know when he became one so the idea was just as the people in that bar don't know that B Bill O'Neill is this guy that enters the space is an FBI agent. I didn't want the audience to know that he was, you know, I wanted the audience to think because you're going to the, you're going, most people don't know even what an FBI informant does. They hear FBI informant undercover movie. They think, okay, this guy works for the FBI, right? So the first time you see him, I wanted you to see him dressed like an FBI agent. And I wanted you to see him go into this bar and talk this way and present as an FBI agent. So you're like, wait a second, this is this FBI agent? Like, and and then when his he gets headbutted and the hat's knocked off, that's the first time you actually see Lakeith's face clearly. Before that, you just see the iconography of the FBI, you know, and, and you, so you're we're manipulating you as a viewer the same way that Bill O'Neill is manipulating the you know people inside that bar so you know that was why we were behind them and that's why we kept the hat low and you know that's why like i like, like charlie's 
Jones, our, our costume designer, she had to specially make that coat because I wanted it to flap in the wind, you know, like like I wanted it to be. And also I knew I knew the kind of movie I was making and I've always felt like it was it's important to end to start a movie strong and end a movie strong. If you start a movie amazing and you end a movie amazing, you have a lot more latitude in the middle to like, you know, not, not always be amazing, you know? So I said, let me, I mean, I, I, the goal was to make the whole thing amazing, but I said, the beginning's gotta be crazy, you know? So when we wrote that beginning and I was like, okay, a knife's going through the, like, it's gotta, we gotta start it like, I remember seeing X-Men 2. And I remember the beginning of X-Men 2 with Nightcrawlers being like, this is how you start a movie, you know? Like mm-hmm. this, like I'm, I'm in now, you know? And it was like, how do we start this movie like X-Men 2, you know? I love that. I love that. And, you know, even like the way that you dress the streets with like the picture cars and like down the streets, like how, you know, it, in always sort of keeping with the time period, you know, mm-hmm. you didn't really mm-hmm. like how much VFX and all that stuff did you have to do afterwards or were you sort of really sort of focusing in on like these spaces and these things that you could actually change so you wouldn't have to, you know, scrub everything out at the end. There were, there were, we did, you know, we, we added VFX, you know, our, incredible uh, VFX editor, Jeremy. He he did an, he just did an amazing job of just like not, it being very subtle and very small, you know, like for example, the, 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 sky, the skyline of Chicago in the background. And when we do the, have those exteriors, it's a mm-hmm. small thing, but it's a, it's a subtle, small detail. You know, the elevated train in the background, but those train tracks were there, you know, but we want to set up that it's Chicago and I think we had another train go by, but you know the attention to detail by all parties involved, you know, including Sam Lysenko, our production designer, to make sure that that train car was a period train car, that they replaced it, they replaced the train that went by with a period train. Um, all you know, it all. There's no, uh, you can't be too specific when you're making something that is a period piece. And the goal, as the, was the goal for all of us, was to immerse you in that period. Even if you're thinking about the, you know, today, which I think you can't help but watch the movie and, and you know, and often think about the world we live in today. The goal was to, when, the, when those titles rolled, to keep you embedded in 1968-69 as much as possible. I love that. And then um, a couple, two more questions, and and this one is for um, this one question is for everybody: is what was the biggest challenge of making this film and what lesson did you learn that you feel like is your sort of either you know life lesson lesson as an actor lesson as a director um you know what was it that you sort of like how were you sort of transformed also just by the making of this movie you know to me every time you make art right you're transformed in a different way what was the thing that sort of affected you the most um and we can we'll start with uh we'll start with dominique sure um i think uh I guess, personally speaking, the biggest challenge, if that's the right word, that I think I uh, felt initially was how how do I play this woman that is not necessarily based on anyone in particular, um, but represent her experiences or the experiences of all women, which is what it inevitably feels like um, authentically. And um, I have to praise Shaka for being so collaborative and communicative. Um, and it really was a conversation. I would tell him all the time, like my only concern is that I don't wanna feel like a prop. I don't want this woman to be a woman in the room simply for representation sake, you know? It's like, how do we make sure that this person um, is fully fledged and fully formed um, so that there is there is no like, parading going on, you know, because the women were very much a, a, a on the ground and very much a, a part of the work being done. Um, so I think just sort of leveling whatever perceived pressure is there with the fact that this is true to life. And as Shaka was saying, like, you can't help about, you can't help but compare it to today. And I think after a while, you sort of realize, oh, Harmon is, I know Harmon, <laughs> you know, I've been Harmon at a period um, in my life and just sort of, you know, relying more on that and relying more on the truth, um, which is easy to do when you're working with people like those on this screen and, and the rest of the people in the cast and the, and the team overall. 
Um, so it was a phenomenal environment, you know, which helps to quell those things. And then I think the, the takeaway is just how amazing and how much work can be done and how strong and how reliable we truly are uh, collectively. That collective strength, that collective vision can take us so far and it has taken us so far. And it's almost insane. It's truly incredible to, to think about how much these people were able to accomplish the work, the legacy, the impact that they were able to have on their community and really at, on the world at large at 19, 20, 21, so, so young and have made an impact that we're, we're sitting down talking about right now. So I think that's a, a testament to our, our individual, but especially our, our collective capability at any age. That's great. Daryl? Um, I'd say that the the toughest part of the entire experience is waking up every day um, wanting to properly honor these women and these men of this party, um, knowing everything that they've um, they had to endure, um, everything they fought for, um, everything they stood for, everything their legacy continues um, to build. Um, so wanting to wanting to do it justice. Um, it's it's an incredibly tall task um, um, because you you know it's it's one of those things that you just you can't afford to get wrong, you know. Um, as an actor, we we sort of get to embody these uh, these these roles, um, these uh, these worlds that we step into. But this is you're playing with real people's lives, um, so it's it's not a game. Um, so so the hardest part being wanting to honor that um, the legacy um, um, in a proper fashion. Um, which is a testament to Shaka, who who sort of is, is you know who guides you in in a way that makes you feel like you're doing the right thing, and he'll never let you take a wrong step. Um, he's always going to to be there, um, um, which is which is an incredible thing to to be a director to do that. Um, and I think for the the takeaway um, is I really do hope that it um, it opens up. Um, a tangible conversation that leads to tangible change. Um, I think we, um, you know, going back to what we spoke about earlier, just the uh, the scrubbing of of the Black Panthers from the the, um, the education system. Um, I, I hope that this, um, you know, sort of like reignites the um, the the conversation about the party and what they actually stood for um, and what they continue to stand for. Um, because it it uh, it's it stays with you forever. This is not the type of role or project that I you know you get to walk away from, and sort of put away and and, and, and stash somewhere. It stays with you, um, and I'm and I'm glad that it does stay with me the way it does, because I want to be able to pass the education that I've learned and that I am continuing to learn every day about the Panther Party um, to my children and and to you know into you know generations to come because it's so important um and it's just not spoken about enough so i just hope that the takeaway is that more conversations that lead to tangible change um happen that's great algae uh yes yeah, sorry i was muted um yeah i just think that there were there were there were two challenges for me. One of the challenges were was not really having anything to um, really follow as far as like my guide to playing this real person's life um, and honoring Jake. But also that was the beauty of it too, because I guess there's just something about my essence that is able to just tap in. And I guess there's just something from the higher power, but like that's the beauty that you can just tap in, you can create from there, you can still make it like, it feels like that was him, you know, it feels like that that's what Jake would have been like. And I think on the second hand, I'm a very sociable person, I'm a very loving person, I love, um, I'm all about the idea also of equality and justice, and I think the hardest part, one of the hardest parts for me was kind of sitting back and wondering if I go hard enough for what I say I believe in. And I think that's, that's something that really, like, it really bothered me, it really bothered me on set a lot, it really bothered me when I was alone a lot, because it's like, I know in my heart that I don't put myself on the front line like the way that they did. And I know in my heart that a lot of people around me don't do that either. And we, and we say that we believe in certain things, but we, but we don't put ourselves on the front line like that. But I also had to realize that my craft is me putting myself on the front line and that this is myself on the front line when I choose to do roles like this. When I choose to pass up on a road that maybe 
is doing something way other than they're offering whatever, but I'm just like, no, because it doesn't speak to my heart. It don't speak to what I want to say. It doesn't speak to what I want to use the gift God gave me to give to the world. And that's what I had to realize as well. So that kept me, um, that kept me in good spirits. And then also I think the takeaway, I want, I just want to agree with Dara. I feel like I just wanted to lead to tangible change. Tangible is a really, it's the, it's the really good word there. Tangible change and tangible conversation that we can have and that we can be able to see. Um, because we just saw Breonna Taylor die the same way that Fred Hampton died. And so, and that, that happened before we ended filming the movie. I mean, after that happened after we filmed the movie. And so to deal with that and then to look back at that trauma, me and Daryl was having conversations about that. It's just like, we see the exact parallels. And so I just hope the takeaway can honestly just be tangible change, but I think we're headed there. I think everyone, um, a lot of people in this generation are like-minded. I think it's just pushing out the old ideas of the old rock that's still in there. Um, so I feel like we're on a good track though. Um, and then Shaka, that it's a combination question for you, right? All of those things, but really how did it change? How did this film change you as a director and as a writer? Um, that was, that was actually what I was gonna speak to. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, the first part of the question, remember what the first part of the question was again? The first, because uh, the first part, what was the biggest challenge? Biggest challenge, biggest challenge. The biggest challenge um, for me was synthesizing the vision that I had. The movie the producers wanted to see, the movie the studio wanted to see, the movie that Fred Hampton Jr. and Akuna Jerry wanted to see and kind of finding those collective points of interest to make one film. Um, and that really, you know, that's the sort of direct answer, but when I look kind of broader, it's, it was about learning how to trust. Learning how to trust, because, you know, as a filmmaker, you, you know, at least me, I know that I know how to trust my collaborators in the field, if you will my crew and my cast, that's easy for me. It, it was a lot more intimidating knowing, you know, hear, hearing horror, horror stories about making movies within the studio system to learn how to trust, you know, my producers who had far more experience than I did and, and who, you know, have been a part of the studio system, you know, a lot longer I've been making movies within them and the studio executives themselves and, you know, balance that with, the demands that the family had. Like it, it required me letting go to some degree of control um, and learning how to bring other voices into the, into the fray and really discern when to be adamant about something remaining one way and when to be flexible. And not even for political purposes, but more so just to get the best out of their ideas because they often had really good ideas, great ideas that if I could just silence my ego and sort of get to the heart of what they were trying to talk to me about, it actually would be beneficial. And so that was a process that took the full scope of the making of the film. It wasn't something I learned in the writing, it wasn't something I learned in the directing, it wasn't something I learned in the editing. It, it's really been throughout. And in terms of what I've changed, uh, as a director or writer, you know, the, everything I did until now, you know, I think there may be a little bit in newlyweeds, I have some of this, but largely, largely everything I did till now um, was a, always like, I thought cerebral, but not necessarily emotional. And that was something that I'd known about my self as a filmmaker, which actually has to do with who I am as a person, I think, in some regard, um, for years. Uh, but this film, having to, like, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, get out of my own way in terms of, like, style and kind of, like, de-emphasizing style uh, in moments where it was clashing with the ability to convey the emotion of the scene that was much more important. Learning how to do that was a real big, big, big part of my growth, I think, as an artist on this movie. I love that. 
Um, very, I think very important. And, and I, I just, by the way, I, w I just want to wrap up by saying thank you all so much for joining us, but I'm going to let Babu actually sort of close it out yeah. and really kind of talk to um, what it means to have this film play at the festival um, and just sort of, to sort of wrap us out all out. It means everything to have this kind of film in the Pan-African Film Festival. This is the purpose of the Pan-African Film Festival, to showcase these kind of wonderful films and spread the, the message about these films all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And good luck on your next endeavors. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Tell you. Great talking to you all, yeah. Bye. Thank you. My name is Ayuko Babu the executive director of the Pan-African Film Festival, inviting you to our 29th annual virtual Pan-African Film and Arts Festival, beginning February 28th to March 14th. Get your tickets today. Hope to see you there.